uh, at Octacon, the 30th Octacon anniversary, celebrating it here as we are virtually. I hope you're all enjoying your weekend. My name is James Bacon. I'm, a, I'm the moderator of this panel, and I am joined by uh, three writers in, uh, from the Judge Dread world, uh, Joseph Elliott Coleman, uh, Moore McHugh, and uh, Michael Carroll, who is also the guest of honour this year at Octacon. So uh, welcome to them, and also welcome to you all. Uh, all Michael uh, is, has been uh, writing Judge Dredd for some time as a comic, but more recently, or in recent times, he started uh, writing novellas, which also Joseph and Maura have now done. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you. So, Michael, first, can you just introduce yourself and talk about your, your work in the novellas, if you don't mind? Sure. Thank you, James. Um, my name is Michael Carroll. I've been writing Dredd in the comics for... For 10 years uh, come January and um, but yeah recently we started the um, Judges series which explores the very early days of the world of Judge Dredd um, back in I don't know 12 13 years ago um, John Wagner and Carlos Guerra gave us uh, a Judge Dredd story called Origins which traced the early days of the Judges definitively because it was always kind of sketchy as to how that played out and um what we've done with the judges series pardon me while i turn around to the late bookshelf is um we've produced a series of novellas this is the omnibus of the first three um that basically detail stories of of the ordinary judges on the streets and um the idea behind the series very quickly is that the first book the first three novellas the first collection of omnibus is set in the year in the decade of the 2030s and then the second set, um, 2040s, then 50s, then 60s, and then 2070s, and that will bring us up to Judge Dredd's time. So it's um, we're kind of doing a history of the future um, and following the, you know, the rough guidelines um, set out by by the origin story and what we know of Judge Dredd's history. Um, it's, it's tremendous fun. We, we have to, um, I, I, I'm sort of overseeing the whole thing. I'm steering the boat, basically, but I'm also paddling um and manning the sails because we have sails and we have paddle and we have an engine but um <laughs> so i'm writing one book in each uh, trilogy and um then we have other writers coming in to give their flavors and then hopefully the plan is once we get to the end of this sequence of of 15 novellas we want to go back to other eras and start exploring the world of judge dread outside of mega city one if you like but that's at the moment we have to see how things go but that's the idea so we have like lots of new writers on board and that's why we have uh, with, uh joseph and maura come on um, to to write uh, episodes for the second volume and they've done phenomenally good work oh, thank you very much that's great so uh next to uh maura uh, your your book in the series was uh psyche here it is here yeah. uh, uh, quite nicely presented as i can say and for a great read well, can you tell us a little bit about it as well, please, Maura? Oh, well, um, I'm a writer from Galway, Maura. I, I write science fiction and fantasy and horror, a lot of horror across lots of different genres. So um, I would have originally read 2000 AD when it was coming out. So I was pretty familiar with the world from its beginning. And over the years, I've kept a continuing interest in it. Uh, as especially after Rebellion took it over and the, they started developing everything. And uh, so I was like, I had already written Judge Anderson for uh, 2000 AD when I got this gig. And uh, so like, it's a lot to me to work in this uh, universe. And it was particularly exciting to go back to the early parts of how and to just think and allow your imagination to run riot on uh, how did things develop to lead up to what will become the mega cities. And, um, you know, Mike actually suggested to me, well, why don't you think about the origins of the side division? And uh, so that's what I, I, I looked at because the side division, I have to say, you know, is very close to my heart and I really like the characters in it. And I also think they're kind of an interesting a group of judges who aren't really um, uh, there by choice. Um, they're there to be corralled and to be used as a weapon of the state, essentially. Mm. So they are um, 
they're indoctrinated certainly by the time you get into you know anderson's mega city like they're literally scooped up at early as possible brought in brainwashed into the system but they their their own their abilities the ability to be empathic with another human being immediately means that you will see things in a way that most judges will not see you know because uh and i mean and that's actually one of the brilliant things about the teaming of anderson and dread is that you have the like the law which is dread and you have anderson who is the shades of gray you know like the law doesn't just is a blunt instrument in normal everyday human lives you know there's a lot of nuance there so yeah um so it was great to go and um, develop these characters and i cheated slightly um <laughs> because i actually have two timelines in the story one in the uh, the the mega the the um the current uh 2000 ad period and one in the and i don't ask me why I decided to do this because it was really complicated and I made more work for myself, but I really enjoyed doing that and people seem to like it. Oh, you pulled it off well. You made it look very, very easy. I mean, I doubt Alfred Bester would have been able to do it. I know it's serious. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, no, there, I was reading it and thought to myself, yeah, Bester wouldn't have been able to have done this and you did it with grace and the yeah. real, real gravitas. So I thought, well, ooh, it's brilliant. So I Joseph. really, really enjoyed your story. Oh really. my God, all, I, you more than mine. I was like, hey, I wish I could have. I wish I thought of that, uh, that myself. But Joseph, you you wrote the Patriots. I, I also have. I that. was just there. Do introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about it, though, for us. Hello, boys and girls. I'm Joseph Philip Coleman. I'm a writer from London Croydon. I mainly write uh, science fiction, and uh, the novel, uh, the judge's story that I've written is the first story that i've written set in the 2000 ad stroke world and um uh, it was influenced mainly by well uh, a lot of 70s uh, science fiction so you've got uh jg ballard uh, uh, uh alfred bester although alfred bester was more pulpy he was in the 1940s 1950s wasn't he uh, but there is a very strong uh, uh, 70s cop feeling going through the novel. So you've got, uh, you know, bullets and um, uh, the French connection, that kind of very, very meaty, visceral uh, 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 crime uh, influence in that story. I mean, one of the three, one of the, the feedbacks that I've got on for the book is that uh, it's one of those, it's one of the rare judges or Judge Dredd stories where you actually see them acting like detectives. So there's, there's a problem, let us go out and find out what mm -hmm. it is, let us get evidence, let us go out and find out who the people are who are actually doing it, why did they do it? How can we uh, 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 deal with them? And uh, yeah, that goes back to that 70s cop influence. I mean, I really, really am a huge fan of uh, uh, crime writing. One of, who's my favorite crime writer? Probably, Oh, good. Who's a guy who wrote, I, I keep forgetting his name, David Levine, a uh, guy who wrote uh, Mystic River. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge yeah. fan of his work. Yeah. Him and, oh, there's another guy who wrote, uh, oh, oh, I can't remember his name, American writer, wrote uh, The Cartel, wrote, uh, oh, it's on the tip of your tongue, I can see it. Hang on, I'll look at my bookshelves. <laughs> I know who you mean, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. That guy, yeah, we can <laughs> your, yeah. I'm a but, huge crime, crime fan myself, that's why I, I love that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, well, you it's well, your, well, your books do uh, one of the things about your books, it, it does feel like you're at the point when you're all writing, it's like for, for it feels like we're on the cusp of the end of the police procedural, yeah, yes, you have to judge procedural, yes, and I think that you know, do a lot of fans enjoy the the judge procedural, the detective element to Judge Dredd or, or the series um, in a different way. But it felt like to me, I was reading like, you know, this is the end of, end of Ed McBain. The, the yes, yes, he's another precinct setting, The precinct setting, the police setting, like when you're all writing the last, well, Michael, Michael's book was the last police officer. Literally, and, yeah. And well, the, last, the last one to be, to pass through the academy, but of course the last yes. set of cops going to be knocking around for several 
decades. That's right. Yeah. And whereas, whereas obviously the the the, the, the police station, the pre precinct station setting, uh, it felt like this was like maybe nearly coming to the end of it. Yes. And that felt important. But that yeah, link. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. So in, in the um. Well, okay, one of the upcoming books um, that has been delivered, I, I can't, um, I'm, I'm kind of going cool about it in detail, but it is, um, it is very much a case of, uh, yeah, the precinct set location, but the cops are very clearly ancillary. The judges have full control. And uh, I do, I, I, in, in my next one, which is uh, next up on the list is Necessary Evil. And, and there's an element of that, but in the next one again, um, by, I wish I could say who it was, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer, and f did a fantastic book, almost as good as Maura and Joseph's books. I mean, like 99. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, yeah. but this one is, um, <laughs> is great. And, it, but it is, it is very much that it is a case of, the almost like the cops are, are hanging on to their concept of, of what a police officer is that you have your precinct out of which you operate and they you go out and you solve the crime but in many ways we can almost see that they're fooling themselves and the judges have taken full control and they're almost it's almost like the judges are patronizing the cops by going oh no no you're you're helping us and you're you're very good at it too i love the way you got that coffee and, and those are very good donuts <laughs> they're, not actually, they're not actually doing that but um, well, one of the problems we faced from the beginning with this was that Judge Dredd, um, the first Judge Dredd stories are set in 2099, but written in 1977, or published in 1977. So there's a huge gulf of time between the, the, the readers reading the stories and when the stories are set. But now we're, we've only got like 15 years between the first Judge's books and, and the current day, uh, less than that now. So Dredd's universe was, in the beginning, it was quite unknowable. We knew there was a mega city, we knew there was judges. We didn't need necessarily to know how it became like that. But as these stories grew, you know, carried on and, and people went, you know, sort of filled in more of the background. Our job now as writers of the judges books is, uh, and, and of course with, with Dreadnoughts, is we are, we are filling in those gaps to a degree, but we're not basing, hang on, how's my space? Yeah, we're not starting from the same starting point that we were in 77, because the the imaginary history of the future was slightly different. And we've had, we've kind of, we're starting from where we are now getting there. Oh, it's, it's very hard to describe this. But um, for example, originally in 2008, there was a, a, an attempt at a shared universe with invasion and um, hinting at the idea of Mega City One was starting to be built in 1999 or the year 2000 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, ABC Warriors and all that sort of stuff was tied into Mega City One, and even some degrees, um, things like um, Robo Hunter were sort of. Um, so we that that's all kind of been um, swept under the carpet and then um, flamethrower. So it's that doesn't happen. Anymore. I want to know, Mike, when the aliens arrive. Yes, and the space that's port. Like that. That's what I'm yeah. like. I I'm really, interested in. really wish people wouldn't do that. <laughs> you don't know that that's not going to be the twist at the end of one of the next judges' books. <laughs> oh. Seriously. You know? well. so, we're not just writers of these things, we're custodians of the future. And uh, we can't bad. let spoilers creep in. You know what happens to me? This is a slight aside, but it really drives me crazy. Is that when people do this online, you post up something and they go, oh, oh, what if you do this? And you go, I know, shut up, I'm doing that. I just don't want to talk about it yet. And it happens with everything I do. It's um, yeah. my Rusty Staples comics blog and I put up something people go, oh, oh, you should do this. I'm going, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, just don't, don't spoil it for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah, the aliens thing has, will be addressed <laughs> just, we can't do it in the obvious way. You see, oh, we yeah. can't, we can't go, um, Judges Book 12, the aliens arrive. It's going to yeah. be something else, but the aliens will have been in the background. Actually, mm -hmm. that's one of the, um, sorry for waffling, but this is one of the key things that we're doing with the, the Judges books is that we're, we're not trying to write um, big, epic, end of the yeah. world, everybody on the seat of their pants are, 
the stories. We're going to write cop stories. And that's what, what Joseph and Maura have done there. It, the stories are, are very important to the key characters, but the world doesn't hinge on what happens in these events because if there was something really huge, like for example, like the Mega City One is invaded by aliens in the year 2060 or something, then how come no one in Dread's time has ever gone, hey, do you remember when the aliens exactly. in that time in 26? Do you remember, remember all the abductions that they did and everything? Yeah. So since we don't have that, um, we as writers of this and custodians of the future, we can't write those stories, but we can write about the cops and the judges on the street. And I think that's much more important anyway. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's very interesting at the moment, particularly. And that's, a, and that's a, about judges and the idea of a judge, jury and executioner. A yeah. judge with Charlotte Clarkson and Neve Douglas, you have two judges who we feel empathy for. We, we, they're, they're, they're the lead characters. We're, we're hoping they succeed. Um, is, that the right, is that the right sense? Is that the right sensibility we should have, these two people who are going to be judge, jury and executioner? Um, well, yeah. well, they're human beings, aren't they? I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, they, they have the same frailties, the same hopes the same whatever as 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 the reader so you would hope that we're on some level that you would empathize with them and at least understand why they're doing what they're doing based on the circumstances that they find themselves in so yeah i guess so i mean go ahead well it's just a, it's a challenge isn't it right because there's an awful lot in in the writings of these books that feels very close to the now. Uh, like, were there any elements? I know you mentioned the seventies, which, and of course, there's a cycle of course. About, of course. Uh, but it feels like uh, the books somehow have been, in a way, prescient of, of where we are currently. Well, it's a, that's that's science fiction for you, isn't it? Science fiction yeah. is you have frequently the uh, the present day looking uh, the future, looking back at the present day. I mean, uh, Star uh, Star Trek. In fact, mo all science fiction ha has been that has been the case. So. Um, I, as I do with a lot of my work, I wrote it very, very, how can I say it? I was quite upset when I was writing it. There was a lot that was happening at the time. Obviously, we know what's happening in the United States and what's happening in, in the UK and in Europe. Uh, so all of that fed into my work. And you know what? Based on what's happened since the book has been published, I really don't think I went as far as I should yeah. have. Yeah. I really, really don't. Because there's... There was a whole chapter that I cut out and rewrote before sending it off to uh, to David Moore, the editor, uh, where basically uh, the um, uh, there's a part in the novel where there is a there's a group of protesters who are going to uh, being corralled by police and judges in Central Park, and there were two or three chapters where. Uh, people, uh, where I'm leading up to a point where they're going to be activated and turned into potentially turned into uh, into berserkers, and there's going to be a big massacre in uh, in, uh, in Central Park. But I actually, exorcised those chapters and rewrote it so that that doesn't happen. But I thought to myself, yeah, it's it re there. I really sh it should have put that material back in because based on everything that we've seen in the post the books pub uh, being published. There, it's far closer to what was, what is going to happen, or what has happened, than what we thought. If that makes sense, it, it does. Because actually, when I read the book, I was like, "This is prophetic." Like in its own way, I was yeah. quite surprised uh, that you know Judge Dredd uh, as a character was a sort of a, a kickback in the seventies. Yes, must have spoken about you know the the kickback towards fascism, but then I didn't. Yes with this series of books to be quite so confronted with today's challenges. And while and you were, there's a subtlety about them, all of them actually, mm -hmm. which is really mm -hmm. nice. But because obviously there's lots of, there's, there's lots of different current issues, dead names, mm -hmm. there's uh, yes. the, the, the naming of, car of people, how they name themselves as well. Yes. Uh, yes. And then there's obviously the strength of feeling of the dispossessed uh, yes. United States and a big, huge, vast gulf between those who, who have and those who yes. have. And then, of course, within that, the, you know, the, the racism of the situation of people. Yes. And I thought yes. it's quite, well, I appreciate you wrote it, uh, uh, you know, when would it be written? Was it 2018, 2017? 
uh, I, if memory says I started writing it at the end of 2016. Okay, so you can see why as a reader and why I'd recommend these books to all readers, mm. it just feels like you're hitting a, a nail with a hammer right, right now. Um, mm. it, do, 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 you, do you feel that now you have more to write, that you want to capture more of what's going on at the moment? Mother of God, yes. Given the opportunity to write a sequel or a series of sequels, it would be even more visceral than uh, the, 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 the books previous. I mean, there's so much that's happening in the world at the moment. I'm behooved to write a response in, to it in terms of uh, uh, the, the judges' works because the idea of fascism, law and order is the perfect medium in order to it, that one can explore those ideals. I really, 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 I'm really looking forward to the opportunity when uh, uh, the camp, uh, the clock is turned back and we all have the opportunity to come back and tell our stories. Especially yours, Michael, because I'm really looking forward to that uh, organization that's uh, it's very, it's strikingly parallel to what the judges are doing, except that they don't have it, it's illegal and it's again and it's how can I say they have very much the same ethos as the judges but it is a criminal organization and I found the idea that them doing what they're doing has parallels with what the police force uh, what the judges are doing but that they're coming at it from a completely different direction. I really, really like to see more of those characters. The the uh, the we're, we're we're kind of restrained in, uh, with the way that the judges' books are going to go because we mm. get out this plan and we don't have to stick to it rigidly, but it, you know it's it's working and so on. But there is every 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 book that arrives as part of the sequence we're going oh you could really build on this oh and um i would love to be able to spin off each of these or most of them anyway into into new um little um if you like um sub series i'd like to see a, a trilogy set immediately following your stuff joseph um but i still think that the way to go is we're, we're, we're building these books as a as a framework and yeah. we fill in the gaps um, later on, but if we don't have the framework fully established, we won't know where we're going. Yeah, yeah. That said, I, I, I think our um, one of the key things we can do is not deliberately try to parallel what's happening in the real world, because we certainly weren't doing that. Um, we, we're basically looking at, because we're writers, and one of the okay. things a writer does is say, what's the worst that could happen in this given situation? And unfortunately, the real world is actually better at finding the worst that could happen than we are. We yeah. are we're in these horrible situations and we're still coming out as optimists when you compare us with the real world. This mm. is, um, yeah, it's shocking. I mean, science fiction does often predict the future. Yeah, usually it's a shotgun effect and it's only the pellets that land are the ones that are noticed. Uh, most science fiction is way off the mark. Um, I mean, yeah. so, so you see my jetpack. Uh, and, no, please give me my jetpack. But uh, we, we are um, we're commentators on on a as in, as in like doing a commentary like a sports person would. Uh, commentators on the culture. Yeah, exactly. But we're yeah. commenting, uh, commenting on on a speculative culture based extrapolated from where we where we currently are. And tragically, as I say, the real world is 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 going faster. The whole yes. matter mm -hmm. thing is. Um, it, it, it's shocking that it's happened because you'd think that we'd know better as a race. Yes. And you know something? Yeah. We don't because people are inherently stupid and greedy and evil and lazy. Yes. Mm. And not all of us individually, but collectively we are. Well, one of the things I think as writers you do is you make people think. And that brings me to my next question from Orma Q. Mm -hmm. and, and thought crime, more. You know, like the uh, is that something to be afraid of? Something to, like your 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 novel featured, as you said yourself, did the start of uh, the side division. Um, what were you what were you looking for there? And um, um, what how do you feel about thought crime generally? Oh well, thought crime in the classic sense is the Orwellian one, which is that you can't even think about bad things. That was to train you to. 
become so brainwashed that you couldn't even think of banned words or you couldn't even <clears throat> think of, pardon me, <coughs> uh, subverting anything. Um, but in, in the case in relation to size, which is that you can read the mind of the people who are having thoughts. I mean, the thing is, and this is a problem, is thoughts aren't actions. You know, and all of us over the course of our lives have many weird thoughts and uh, you may actually even have graphic uh, fancies of killing people, but that's your way of dealing with something that is necessarily something you act upon, you know, so having someone who can like drill into your brain and actually figure exactly what you're thinking about that's a very frightening thing and of course. So where I took it from was that there was already some people who were arising out of our population with these interesting gifts. But the first thing the judges were like, I, we got to control this because yeah. if we don't control this, we are completely vulnerable. And that's, it's actually very, it's very like the X-Men and stuff like that. It's like the rise of new powers. So what are you going to do? So the judges in this case, they run a side if it's not called that um, as a black ops operation because there's not a lot of them and they, uh, they're, they don't want to be associated with it in a way. And actually, one of the things I looked at a lot was the history in, um, in American um, covert agencies of trying to develop. <laughs> so, you know, the men who stare at goats, that whole scenario which is i actually did a mk ultra i did a lot of research on actually on that and my you know the idea is that partly from these experiments is why some of these people are cropping up now uh, there's been a lot of uh, ideas as to why the rise of what they often refer to as mutants in 2000 ad which mm -hmm. are people with it, technically depending on how you want to look at mutants but certainly um if the people with psychic abilities weren't uh, useful to the Justice Department, they'd be chucked out into the cursed land, you know, because they're, well, though that has changed, the, the hardline stance on, on mutants has changed in 2000 AD, now to be fair. But anyway, this is, so all of these things were percolation in my mind. What are you going to do if you're running a Black Ops group? How are you going to use it? And also it's literally just starting, so, um, and then I also looked at the idea of other agencies in uh, interfering with the uh, government of another country, which is a big thing in 2000 AD. Uh, in the Cold War was still ongoing. And so I was trying to, to knit that through. I was like, well, and actually to the point of, uh, you know, that, you know, it was always that it was the kind of the the Russians were the, the bad guys. And weirdly, that all dropped off after the, war, the Cold War went away. And this is what I mean about cycles, everything cycles around and suddenly, um, now we're looking at um, these incredibly sophisticated ways of subverting the state via technology, um, as well as uh, just classic, um, you know, uh, spy craft. Uh, which an infiltration. So I was kind of, I, so I kind of looked at it from these, uh, that was one of the things I was trying to niche into the story. Okay, that, but that's, well, I felt that you were, the way you were weaving the two eras, because it's, uh, am I right in thinking it's 2141 and 2044, so nearly 100 years between it. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it, it fitted very well, and the epistolary nature of it, where you were reading reports mm -hmm. um, and everything was clearly dated. I thought that worked very strongly. Yeah, I really like, um, I was also tapping into the found footage style of stuff. And that was one of the things I looked at. So I, I designed it immediately. That's how I had it in my mind, you know, that I would do it this way. Um, and uh, because it also gives you the chance to see multiple points of view of the same story you know which it, that's why people still use this device because it's very useful so uh, yeah well i well, i thought it was very good um but then i've enjoyed all your books so um and i can only uh, highly recommend them 
<laughs> question, a question now maybe relating back is uh, we've we've sort of had a question in from one of our our, our, our uh, viewers, so I thought I should throw that to you. Um, yeah. And it, it sort of starts off with how, uh, I actually want to adjust it a bit, but we've seen some imagery um, uh, from comic books appear uh, uh, co-opted by American uh, right-wing protesters. Occasionally we've seen a Captain America uh, shield, which didn't last very long. And we know that soldiers in various organizations have used a Punisher emblem. And uh, sometimes the American right uses the Punisher emblem. Judge Dredd, hasn't really been co-opted as a as a as a right wing symbol, or are we wrong? Like, is there a... outside, outside of the mainstream, uh, outside of the comics scene, nobody in America really knows Dread in the same way that they, they would in the UK or over here, or even in in uh, Europe. Um, Dread never really took hold, apart from the Stallone movie, and <laughs> to a lot of people, that's all that Judge Dread is in America. He, it's it's the Stallone movie. Um, so yeah, we're lucky that it hasn't been, um, that dread symbolism hasn't been taken over because you've got the, the gold shields and the eagles and all that sort of stuff. And what was the name of that other group used to have gold shields and eagles? And I can't remember, it begins with mm. N. Um, mm. So, the name escapes me. Yeah, yeah but it, the it, thing is, that, that um, this is the thing that people forget is that Carlos was raised in fas fascist Spain. Uh, Spain. Like, if you look at the design, which is like incredible design of the, it, you know, it's this glam 70s mashed up with, uh, you know, na um, fascist symbols and the, and the, and, you know, the eagle being the symbol of the states, but also say the eagle was used in Mussolini's Italy, you know, and, and it's a Roman Empire thing. So it's like, I mean, his, his, I mean, I, I think that's a thing to really remember is that that was very clear right from the, the get go. Sorry to interrupt you, Mike. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly um, exactly it. it um, is that the judges are fascists in the sense that they believe in the, uh, the importance of the state over the importance of the individual um, or the needs of the many, many outweighing the needs of the, the one. But um, Dread himself um, is is a tool of the fascist state, but is he an actual fascist? We can argue the old uh, thing about the Nazis is that if you have eleven people sitting down to dinner with one Nazi, how many Nazis are at the table? And mm -hmm. the answer there, of course, is is twelve. But um, because if you tolerate or you allow these things to be tolerated, then you are complicit. Um, so the judges are. You know they are they're not necessarily the good guys and even if they're you know ostensibly trying to do good things they are standing on the the necks or kneeling on the necks of the people um to put to to further the cause of the state or to further what they believe is the cause of the state but the thing is they're the cops anywhere are effectively um arguably just sanctioned bouncers you know they the state says you <laughs> Are allowed to to do this to to enforce the rules that we have arbitrarily decided apply. And sometimes the rules are no one is allowed to you know sit on the on the bus or the train without a mask. And sometimes the rules are that if your skin is darker than this shade, then you are not allowed to drink from this water fountain. Mm. I mean that was in my lifetime that they had that. You know, well, okay, well, it was the sixties. I was born in sixty six. Um, that was still legal. You know, it, it was immoral. But it's still legal. Well, apartheid was was quite recent. Well, of course, mm. and, and we argue we we still have apartheid in, in in America because you've got a case where there's a bunch of guys who are plotting to uh, kidnap a, a, a senator and put her on a mock trial, um, and it because their skin is white, they're not called terrorists; they're called militias. I mean, how the hell does that make any sense? So, you know, I'm, we're getting really serious here, but that's that's if those guys had been brown or black. There is no way that would have been allowed to say it like that, you know. And, that, and and that's also a lot, obviously, media and how things are portrayed ties yeah. into that too. But who controls the media? It's the white people. Mm. Well, exactly. We're people with wealth as well. Well, um, of course. Well, that's what I meant. That's kind of yeah, really the exact same thing. White people and people with wealth. There's really not much of a difference there, mm. you know, apart from Chris Rock. But you know. Um, and but maybe this identifies something else because, as you say, it gets very serious. You all take your research very serious. 
Joseph, did you do a, a lot of research, um, uh, you know, for your, for your writing? Was this, um, like obviously, you know, it's not a case of where your ideas come from. That's to be a dreadful question. But, uh, well, you know, what sort of research do you put in? Well, only in so much as what, uh, what I was aware of from history, what I had read previously and what was happening in the now. So uh, it wasn't so much necessary to do research. It was a case of everything that was happening at the moment was informing everything that I was writing. So the research was concurrent. It was happening at that moment. So it fed into everything. This is sort of fed into the work. So I wouldn't really say I sat down and went through works of, uh, you know, nonfiction to find out the, the, the history of uh, 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 the police interactions with uh, Black America, because you know, growing up, you know it. You know, you've read about it, you've been taught about it. Well, if you're from a certain middle class Black, uh, 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 family, you were, you're taught these things. So I didn't really do any hard research because a lot of it is already known to me. So, mm. yeah. And and Maura, what about yourself? Did you like obviously you're a fan for some time? So did you need to do any any special research for this, or did it just? Well, yeah. I mean, I have to say, Origins is the Bible when you're starting. And in fact, what's crazy when you read Origins is how prescient that is, in fact, uh, you know, the rise of this um, really uh, megalomaniac uh, president in the US is, and the way it, the way that goes. I mean, I, so uh, yeah, that, that graphic novel, I probably read that numerous times uh, throughout when the writing process. But then there was all the research I was doing on other things like, and also I think I was saying to Mike at one point that if anyone looked at my browser history when I was writing that book, they would be sure I was, I was setting out to kill people because it was all this like really nerdy stuff about guns and uh, you know, how to build a, a suicide vest, um, you know, uh, surveillance, all that stuff. And the thing is that actually, I'm a classic geek is that I actually really like looking at things like this, you know, <laughs> I really like weapons, I really like tanks, I really like, you know, that stuff, I don't know why, and, and, and this is a great example of, I don't want to shoot any of these things, <laughs> I don't want to be around them, <laughs> but from a kind of tech nerdy type of person, I, that stuff I, I love, I love looking at all of those things. Um, so yeah that's that so that's the kind of research so I mean, yeah i did a tremendous amount and just trying to get i mean we had discussions even the whole nerd continuity of like which lawgiver are we using or mm. you know they're all different slightly different names uh, set in the past and the idea that you everything is evolving up uh you know things aren't as they are in mega city so you're you, so we often have these behind the scenes conversations about <laughs> that kind of stuff you know yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of things to be thinking about. And, uh, but I think going back to what Mike said, this to me is the important thing is that you're writing stories, stories have humans in it, and humans, they're human stories, and they're set in moments as well. They're not set in, like literally, uh, Mike could commission thousands of stories, you know, and each of them set in yeah. moments. Do you know what I mean? So it's, and also these are just sort of, I like to think of the Dreadverse as this horrible <laughs> alternate universe <laughs> that thankfully I don't live in. <laughs> and Mike, you're, you're there knitting all this together neatly. Yeah. Well, or giving guidance. Like, do you have some sort of super spreadsheet Gantt chart or, or something? I wish. Or, yeah. or is it all just, or, you know, um, how, do you, how do you go what, about what happens putting is, this together? Um, Myself and uh, David Thomas Moore, who's basically the uh, the proper series editor. I'm 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 more of a um, I'm I'm the shepherd, but he's the one who owns the farm, if you like. Um, he's he basically he and I have, have worked out we worked out the basic idea, which was to tell <clears throat> the uh, the future history from from 2030s on um, up to Dread's time. But um, yeah, we there's certain things that that aren't actually 
ever and then had previously never been actually clarified as to when does Mega City One actually become Mega City One? Um, we have to squint a little because you know the actual population of the United States is not big enough to sustain an any mega city. Um, it never was and it never will be. But so we pretending that it happens. So, but at what point um, is New York City no longer referred to by the people as New York City? Mm. Or what stage does Philadelphia and Boston get merged into the, the mega city? Um, when where does the name come from even? Um, so as well as having the judges. Um, form from if you like the the beaten and burnt ashes of the the uh, the, the police state um we have the city coming from somewhere um so we we basically worked out when these things should happen and the these books are kind of describing how they happen to a degree um i i always liken it to um more like to rogue one than the star wars main trilogy or yeah, main yeah, series yeah. of movies because what we're doing is we're showing key moments um but maybe from a different perspective than we've already than we've previously seen um so with uh if i if i pick say um well it's easier to pick my own books um with Golgotha we have um judge kwan who's the first uh, the final judge to to pass through a, a police academy um because we knew at some point that the police are phased out even though in early Judge Dredd stories are said cops hanging around as kind of picking up the pieces after the judges. But uh, we decided arbitrarily that, you know, hang on, 2040s, the police academies are shut down because the judges have seen to be a success. We couldn't have that happen in 2030s because the judges are only starting. 2050s is a bit too late. So that's kind of what we're doing. And uh, yeah, so D David Thomas Moore is, is the series editor. He's, um, he's very very intelligent guy. He knows exactly what Right. Uh, what he wants and it's my job to make him give me money to do it and, <laughs> um yeah and and like i said what we what we're doing here is um uh, be because each set of books is set in a different decade each trilogy is the, the 30s 40s 50s 60s and 70s um it's very hard to do sequels because otherwise we're skipping you know ahead like for example if we want to do a sequel to the patriots and hopefully as i say one day we'd love to come back to that it would have to be set um, a decade ahead in, in the 2050s or, or well, actually not anymore because we're, we're going beyond that now into the 2060s soon enough. So um, I'm cheating because I'm sort of, as I say, the shepherd and my, my I'm allowing my characters to uh, to carry through. But uh, it is, um, it, it's a weird kind of situation in which we find ourselves that we could dwell and linger on the early days, but we kind of need to skip ahead and fill in the, um, the yeah. decades. But I really, really want to be able to expand this and go to Brits it and mm -hmm. find out how did yeah. movies all come about? Well, that's, that's, maybe, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, maybe a good jump off for our next question. And actually just going back, some of our uh, watchers have this very interesting question here, uh, which says that uh, Judge Corey was one of the most interesting characters destroyed by her talent. Will we see more judges suffering similar existential crises? But the, and that might lead us to the question, which is where would you like to go next as writers if you did have that uh, sand pit? Mike, it sounds like you own the sand pit. So I'm going to go to Joseph and Moore first uh, 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 and see what, you know, or maybe where you're going next, uh, which you're writing for uh, Rebellion either, whichever you prefer. Joseph. Well, um, I would like to talk a bit Specifically, I would like to talk, uh, if I was had the opportunity to do a sequel to the pages, I would like to uh, talk about gentrification and lead into perhaps the first commissioning of the mega city blocks, potentially. I mean, you don't actually have to see them, maybe they're, uh, yeah. they're put that's, on the drawing board. Yeah, that's happening in the next Necessary Evil. So. <laughs> Bugger! Yeah, um, see, that's part of the problem here. <laughs> I should send you that, by the way. Yes, I, I would will, like to read yeah, that. I will, yeah. And more, I'll send you a copy as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, see, that's a very good point. See, that shows that proves that Joseph is on the exact same wavelength as we are. He knows where these things should go. So yeah, but what I would like to do is, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hijacking this again. Um, with the Dreadnought series, is that we're we're sort of lingering on on early Dread tales, and I think that's something that we could do with specific characters that you guys have created. I if, love that. You mean in the comic? 
yes to do yes. one-offs here and there or maybe a like like a limited series you know four issues or five issues just to explore um the answers to questions that have already been asked uh, maybe but so questions have been asked but not answered yet um so you guys have done a huge amount of brilliant work and we need to build on that it, it's crazy just to let it sit there so you know and more is there anywhere you would like to go or what or maybe i should be more specific because we've only got seven minutes left yeah well um, what are you working on next yeah, Mike and I have talked about a little bit about this, but I would really like to continue with the characters that I created in the in in Psyche. Um, and I have ideas for like in my mind, which I've never talked about my, to Mike. You know, the thing is, once you create characters, they live in your head for a yes. long time. Yes. They go on dates or not in the case of judges, but they go on and have lives, you know, <laughs> and you imagine their later life. So, yeah, I've thought a lot about those two, about the characters and where they would go and the uh, increasing of them. And the problems that would cause and up to the point where side div actually becomes a division you know so yeah i've 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 thought about that um i'm doing i've just had a story out uh, just to follow on from what you were saying i've just had a story out in misty scream uh, special i had a story in the smash special um i was in the meg i did an anderson story in the meg the 30th anniversary wow how how honored did i feel to be in such amazing company um i had a, a series i did last year in the meg as well which was with patty goddard and that was another anderson story um so yeah i mean i really love writing comics like i think might be my favorite media <laughs> um, especially mine yeah it's it's like i just love it so much and uh though i love prose and i love writing for film and all these other things that i do as well um uh but yeah i just really love writing comics and uh so i um hopefully i've got some ideas for more 2018 stuff but targ knows <laughs> uh, it all has to be pitched and accepted. The entire care to agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. They all, they all, they all watching and all knowing. Tar. Yeah. yeah. So you just. Yes, you know, <laughs> yeah, and then there's other stuff of my own own projects mm -hmm. that I'm working on, and things take development. I think the thing people forget with writers is there's so much that doesn't happen. So much that doesn't happen. You develop stuff. You write stuff. You pitch it. It, it, you know, goes to a very long stage, it can drop, you know, don't get a publisher. COVID-19 is creating all sorts of crazy uh, issues with publishers as well, so, yeah. And Joseph, what about yourself? Have you any uh, projects in mind in the future or anything you'd like to... In terms of... Uh, in the trade world, world. yeah. Um, as I said, I'm still doing research for this project that, I, that I'm going to pitch in more than likely in January or February, but okay. off my own back, I am right. I am near the end of writing a novel that I started writing way back in 2008. It was actually a, an end of year project for an illustration degree. And uh, I'm now at a point now, it was the first novel that I had written and I couldn't write it the way I wanted to write it because I didn't have the skills yet. So what I've done is I've continually rewritten it over the past, Oh, good run, about 12 years and I'm on the final hopefully and 20th draft of the wow. yeah wow. it's it's really 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 close to my heart I mean it's as important to me as let's say Frank Herbert's June was to him oh okay it's, well it really, <laughs> I, 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 can, you, can you just give us can you give us a hint of what it's about uh, where it's set no it's uh, it's 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 a science fantasy novel set in an alternate uh, United Kingdom where various things didn't happen. There wasn't a Second World War. There's no transcontinental slavery. There was no uh, uh, Holocaust, no rise of neo-fascism. But there are a lot of parallels of our world. And it is significantly more female-based. So you've got more female characters in position of power and authority. And there's uh, a lot more paganism in this right. world than there is in our world. And what it is is that um, uh, it's about a young half black half asian 
girl living in the United Kingdom who finds out that uh, the world that she lived in and the beliefs that she had don't actually match up with uh, the life that her parents have lived. And she found out there's this whole secret world that her parents are part of that she slowly gets brought into. And then something happens that completely destroys her world and she's forced to deal with a huge responsibility. It's... Ah. Sounds yeah. a bit epic and sounds good. We should all keep an eye open for it. And, but yeah, I'm sure we'll all do. Yeah. Um, that sounds really fascinating. And Mike, what's what's next for you in the world of 2008? Have you anything coming up? Oh, oh. 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 Hey, big day. Uh, collection of stories from the magazine that I've edited. Um, but yeah, I've got a bunch of things coming up. I've got a dread story coming up with art by Will Simpson. Oh wow! Like ticking off one of the big boxes. Will is the business, and that oh, looks so good. Fantastic! Is that um, a Judge Dredd story? Yes, it is a four-part Dredd story. Will Simpson wow. art. A few other things coming up, and um, isn't it great to see people coming stuff. back into the folds? Will right? is oh, it yeah, great to yeah, see? yeah. Oh, Will's the business, and he's such a nice guy. He's so funny as well. So, yeah. well, that yeah. sounds brilliant. So we're just coming now to the end of our time. Thank we you, James. Comments. As uh, somebody said. Uh, please tell the panelists I've only ever read one of the Black Flame Judge Dread books, but I'm now going to hunt down their Judge books and smash through them. I think Thank smash through them is in a positive way. So I think that's Thank really you. Cool. And I again, uh, I for you know I love the uh, I love science fiction which is set just over the horizon, not too far away, where it's grounded as as Joseph mentioned. You know, great science fiction reflects on what's around us today. And these judges' books are, are really achieving that, and, and I think that they're really worth seeking out. Um, but thank you to uh, Michael Carroll, Moore McHugh, Joseph Ailey Coleman for joining us this morning, or my goodness, this afternoon now at Octacon. Uh, there is a tip jar. Uh, uh, Octacon is uh, working uh, with the Jigsaw Project, and we're uh, raising funds there, which is great. And I, I checked myself this morning, and it was nearly at 700 euro, which is just amazing. Uh, oh, so thank you. For, uh, thank you for all the tips and, and, and for supporting Octacon. Um, next on Twitch, we have uh, Lost in Translation. Tr my goodness. Lost in Translation. I'm not able to say that, am I? Uh, dubs versus subs. And on the fan chat by Discord, there's Remembering Blake Seven. Uh, but thank you all for watching us and joining today. And once again, Joseph, Mora, and Michael, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, James. No problem at all. Cheers. <laughs>